The biggest problem people have is they don't think they're supposed to have problems. When we see adversity as an adversary, we try to avoid pain, but none of us can go around it. You can't go over it. You can't go under it. You can only grow through it. I wanna share this with you today because I'm convinced you are the magic the world needs right now. And if you can learn to leverage your own adversity, whatever it is, you'll unlock that magic. Tonight's keynote commencement speaker is a great story of someone who's come to Austin and then gotten involved in a big way. We've talked tonight about living lives of positive impact. Hayes Barnard is a testament to what's possible when you're committed to making a difference. We tend to have certain expectations for the ways a very successful tech entrepreneur engages with the world, and Hayes defies them. Not only is he a force in business, as founder, chairman, and CEO of leading fintech company Goodleap, and founder and chairman of investment platform Goodfinch, he's also a global force for good. Hayes founded the nonprofit Give Power to deploy solar water farms that increase access to clean drinking water for hundreds of thousands of people every day. From Haiti to Kenya, Nepal to the Congo, Give Power's innovative solutions are improving health and saving lives in 24 countries. We're thrilled that a portion of Give Power's work to change the world is starting here in Austin and in partnership with our students. On our Pickle Research Campus, Longhorns helped build part of a water desalination system that will produce 75,000 liters of water for 35,000 people each day. This firing path that Hayes has forged in achieving business and philanthropic success is empowering communities, empowering a better future for us all. We're thrilled he's moved to Austin, we're thrilled he's working with our students, and we're thrilled he's with us here tonight. Longhorn Nation, please welcome your 2023 commencement speaker, Hayes Barnard. Well, thank you, President Hartzell, for that gracious introduction. And thank you to all the staff who has put so much effort into making this celebration possible. I couldn't be more honored and humbled to be here with you this evening. Wow, standing here in this great stadium with such impressive graduates. Let's just take a moment, look around, and soak it in. The last time I attended a university graduation, I received my own diploma and I heard my mother cry out from the top of her lungs, it's a miracle! <laughs> yeah, she meant it, and she actually sounds like that. It was her accomplishment as much as it was mine. Well, you're here thanks to the people who have an unwavering commitment in you, your parents, grandparents, siblings, all those teachers, coaches, friends, those who you love, and those who love you. So graduates, one more time, please stand with me and let's give them our thanks. Come on. Beautiful. So good. Now, all those people in support of these exceptional graduates, please stand up and let's give them that warm ovation right back. There we go. Let them hear it. Love it. Yes. Beautiful. Amazing. So, so good. So here we are with all 50,000 of you. Okay, look, I didn't attend UT, but I do live here in Austin and I love this city. And I have so much respect and admiration for all of you and what you've achieved here today. It obviously wasn't easy. I mean, you've been on a journey of ups and downs. You've officially survived celebrating life on Dirty Sixth Street over here. I mean, and the painful hangovers the morning after. I mean, look, honestly, I'm not brave enough to go up down, down there. You're not gonna see me, so respect. From the classroom to COVID and back again, you've had a unique four years from all those juicy burgers at Dirties and late night karaoke at Moody's. I mean, you're clearly driven people. 
And I know you're kind people too, sharing all those high fives with Mike at the crosswalk every day. I mean, come on, Mike. Everybody loves Mike, right? And I know you're patient. I mean, endless patience to navigate the hyper-efficient wait list for class registration every semester. (laughs) So smile. I mean, you've all shown real resilience to get here. From the ecstasy of the Sweet 16 win to the agony of the Elite Eight loss. Mm. From the highs of the Longhorns completely smashing Oklahoma 49 to zero in the Red River Showdown. You know. (laughs) To the lows of the heartbreaker against Alabama when I walked home along your side, absolutely devastated. Mm. Okay, you get it. Look, I haven't been to West Fest or Kirby Lane for hangover brunch, but I've done a little research, and there are three million people who will graduate from college in the United States this year. That means there are thousands of commencement speeches from thousands of speakers for words of wisdom, advice, and way too much inspiration. So why am I here, and what do I have to give? Well, I ask myself that question many times, and I'm asking myself that question right now. So graduates, the only thing I feel like I maybe nailed in my life is I know my mission. I know my purpose. And maybe, just maybe, I can help you find yours. So I figured the best place to start is right from the beginning. Chapter one, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I'm the only son of Diane Barnard who is here with me today. Give it up to her. A single mother that worked multiple jobs to raise her only boy, me, Hayden Dickinson Barnard. She called me Boogie. During my entire childhood, we rented a two-bedroom apartment at 574 Town Hall Court in Crevecourt, Missouri, until I graduated from college. So I was like 22, and I shared one bathroom with my mother, which was, well, perfect. I met my father for the first time when I was 30 years old, and the gap left by his absence and severe alcoholism was challenging for me. But it was also a gift, because it taught me how to turn my loneliness into leadership. I grew up in a neighborhood filled with single moms, carrying multiple jobs, but I was fortunate to witness my mother grind just to make ends meet. She worked two even three jobs sometimes just to keep a roof over our head. And she still found the time every single night to walk to that laundromat and wash my grass-stained football uniform. She was and will always be my hero. It was a total blessing to attend Riverbend Elementary School, and I had the best first grade teacher of all time, Mrs. Macy, notify me I had totally flunked and would be joining her for another lab. So for the next 12 years, all my friends would look down on me from the grade above. Let's just say I was enjoying many a days in the resource room, known sarcastically as the romper room. Now look, I don't wanna brag, but I did eventually get an 18 on the ACT, and then I crushed the SAT with a staggering 900-ish score. I mean, come on, we're talking about some serious academics here. (laughs) <laughs> no, no, it, it wouldn't be until a few years later that I was officially diagnosed with dyslexia. But my learning differences forced me to develop unique communication and reasoning skills. Without them, I wouldn't be who I am today. The dyslexic advantage is special. While you can't read well, you can read situations well. While you can't see the same way someone else might see, you can clearly see how concepts, complex concepts, can come together to achieve remarkable outcomes. My dyslexia gave me patience for others, and more importantly, an appreciation for how much there is to gain by surrounding myself with amazing people, talented people, extraordinary people. And I quickly realized I may not always be the smartest person in the room. In fact, I would learn those that think they're always the smartest person in the room, you know, the ones that think they never have anything to learn from people in the room, never lead the people in the room for long. In retrospect, every single one of my life's challenges helped me find clarity in my why. The pain of my childhood gave me empathy for the vulnerable. 
and respect for the underdog. Without them, I wouldn't know what I value. Without them, I wouldn't know what gives me joy. But I had to learn to use my adversity to my advantage. Here's why. The biggest problem people have is they don't think they're supposed to have problems. When we see adversity as an adversary, we try to avoid pain, but none of us can go around it. You can't go over it. You can't go under it. You can only grow through it. Our minds, like our bodies, try to protect us from pain and challenges. Our instincts try to defend us from experiencing anything that hurts. But our deepest purpose lies on the other side of difficulty and sacrifice. I wanna share this with you today because I'm convinced you are the magic the world needs right now. And if you can learn to leverage your own adversity, whatever it is, you'll unlock that magic. Chapter two, if you wanna change the world for everyone, begin by changing the world for someone. People tend to be so focused on the horizon, they forget to look at what's right in front of them. As a kid, I used to watch my mom load her trunk full of law books, selling to attorney's offices door by door during the day, selling clothes in the evenings, and then serving as a substitute teacher when she could, and then gardening our neighbor's yards on the weekends. I saw her do all this with a pep in her step and pure joy on her face. She never took a sick day. She was and still is an unwavering optimist of unparalleled dedication. She'd say, oh, well, honey, you know these people. They just can't keep up with me. <laughs> but that wasn't always enough. She'd often struggle to pay the bills, and I remember watching her sell my grandmother's jewelry just to make a $445 rent and $50 air conditioning payment during hot Missouri summers. I was just a kid, and man, I wanted to help her, but I just didn't know how. Well... That was a defining moment where I found my first life's purpose. The moment I realized I love someone and I care about something more than myself. And this gave me clarity. It gave me a mission to protect my mother and others in her situation. I thought, okay, if one day I can help one person afford their bills by working just one job they love, I will have exceeded. I thought, if I can help someone own their home rather than pay rent forever, now that's life-changing peace of mind. It took me 20 years to bring that idea to fruition. But ultimately, that's why I created my first company, helping someone own their home versus pay rent while lowering their monthly bills and using that extra cash to better their families' lives. Well, that became paramount to my life. I started it with my two best friends, those guys I loved who carried me through class in high school and college. Okay, well, fortunately for us, it went really well for the first three years. We got to help tens of thousands of families and received countless letters describing how their lives were positively changed. We employed over 2,000 people and became successful in both impact and profit. It was so gratifying. I felt like we were on top of the world and honestly, I thought it would never end. Now, if you ask anyone to name the absolute worst time in history to be involved in the business of financing housing, at the top of the list would be the 2008 global financial crisis. Now, you were probably around six years old at the time, so you won't remember it well, but we had a deep recession, one that almost became a depression and everyone was struggling. And it looked like we were about to lose everything too. It was one of the darkest moments of my life. I would have panic attacks in my driveway some nights before I could face my wife and kids. But knowing that I had a mission that was bigger than myself, reading those customer letters every day was what pushed me to persevere and prosper. In the end, we were not only able to survive, we were able to thrive. The lesson was clear, purpose is the engine of prosperity and adversity is the fuel. Your pursuit to relentlessly help others is your drivetrain to a fulfilled life and your leverage to never quit. Chapter three, sometimes the biggest revelations can come from just laying in the dirt. During the height of the financial crisis, I took my team to Mali, Africa to build a school in the Zeramburu village. I knew we needed to find more ways to give back, to gain a grateful perspective and rid ourselves of a victim mindset. 
The village had no school, no light, no electricity. We did physical labor during the hot days and bonded with our gracious hosts during the evenings. One morning, around 4 a.m., I awoke to a woman named Awa, shuffling grain, a type of millet we would eat later for every meal. As I looked into her eyes with my headlamp on, she flashed a giant smile, just like my mother's. As she departed to walk over three miles to that river just to get water, I noticed a familiar pep in her step. That love she put into cooking food, her loud laughter as she swept dirt from her hut, that soft touch she used to care for the lesions on her baby caused from bathing in brackish water. I will move me and stirred something in my soul. I could recognize my mother in her eyes. The circumstances were different, but the story was the same. Her unwavering commitment to her child's health, education, and a better life. That night, as I laid in the dirt, I heard a whisper from deep inside, encouraging me to do more, be more, see more, and feel more. I decided right there, underneath the stars, that I would try to help this woman, just like I had helped my own mother. I spent the remaining hours before dawn plotting how. I thought, how do I help Awa spend more time filling her brain in the classroom instead of filling her bucket from the river? I realized the new game must be inspired by contribution, not my own significance, because I'll never be significant enough. The new game was going to give me an even stronger purpose to win the giving competition with a grateful perspective. Chapter four, I believe the future is good. And when you are focused on solving one problem for one person, you're solving your own. After that trip, I met one of my greatest mentors and formed some other extraordinary partnerships. We vowed to devote the rest of our careers to lowering carbon emissions and saving people money with clean energy throughout the world, which led us to deploy over one million solar systems. But it all started with one solar system to reduce one electric bill for one homeowner. At our Give Power facility here in Austin, we're building off-grid solar water farms, providing healthy, affordable drinking water for people in drought-stricken areas. It turns out you can't solve education for women, equality issues, migration issues, economic issues, until you first provide healthy drinking water. But it all started with one solar water farm for one liter of healthy water for one child. And you never know, your purpose may come from one idea inspired by one woman after laying in the dirt one night. So tomorrow when you see a huge problem, don't get overwhelmed by the scale of it. Instead, recognize the power of one. Just try to find one thing you can do to start solving one problem for one person. Knowing that that one thing starts momentum which can create a ripple effect of tremendous scale and impact. It's the transformation of becoming a mission-driven citizen capable of helping others, even if that other is just one person you love with one problem worthy of hooking your horns into. Some of the best work is happening right here on this very campus. Give Power is sending our first group of UT students on treks to install these transformative solutions throughout the developing world. And those of you, those of you that are involved are proving what starts here is indeed going to change the world. That excitement, that feeling that we're just beginning, that's what this commencement ceremony is all about. So what does that mean for us right now? What do we do DX? I mean, maybe you're just like, look, Hayes, that's a lot. I'm just worried about where I'm gonna live and how I'm gonna afford you know, living on my own and maybe AI is gonna take my job. Look, if you're worried about the uncertainty on the other side of this ceremony, I want you to know, look at me, you're not alone. I'm right there with you. We're all right there with you. I mean, out of all the speakers, icon, legends, leaders, extraordinary humans doing commencement speeches this year, let me tell you, nobody has it figured out, really. We're all still here struggling on what we're doing on this planet, why we're spinning in the middle of space on a random Saturday, constantly feeling like we're not enough for our friends, our teachers, 
our mentors, our heroes, ourselves. In fact, the more successful you become, the louder these voices become in your mind. The more you become a rainmaker, the more you need to invest in umbrellas. So take everything I've shared with you today with a big fat grain of salt and don't feel so much pressure to be a world shaker tomorrow. At your age, you're not supposed to have it all figured out and hopefully it's refreshing to know actually nobody has it all figured out and hopefully there's something in the silence of knowing that. But hey, it's always worth it to dream big. Pay attention to how adversity sparks you and pursue it with an unyielding heart. So close your eyes. Everybody just close your eyes. Picture a timeline of your life from your childhood to high school, to college, wherever you are. Come on, have fun with it. See a wavelength with the peaks and valleys, all the ups and downs of your adventure, the big wins, the big losses. There are days when you're feeling like everything is stacked against you. And there are nights like tonight, like this one right now, when you put a cap and gown on and say, I have a degree from the University of Texas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. You can open your eyes and smile now. What about that separates those two moments? What connects each peak to each valley? Is it growth? Is it learning? In one way, your life is about to be completely different than what you've experienced over the last 22 years. It's been said that in school, you receive the lesson and then you take the test. But in life, you get the test and then you receive the lesson. You see, without challenge, there's no strength. And without fear, there's no courage. And pressure always proves principles. The great philosopher Carl Jung says, no tree can grow to the heavens unless its roots can reach to hell. Now that's deep. Now, I want you to think again about that wavelength you drew in your mind earlier, that timeline with all the ups and all the downs. I'm guessing you pictured the successes at the top, right? Your wins and accomplishments, and then you pictured the struggles at the bottom, your losses and those challenges. Well, my friends, if that's the picture you still have in your head, I'm here to tell you, you have it upside down. Flip that chart around and reorient your relationship with hardship. Those pain points are the peaks because those are the moments you discover who you really are. Each one of those pain points could lead you to a breakdown or an amazing breakthrough. So reflect with me here. On those best days, those days like today, your graduation day, when everything is going your way, never lose compassion for the underdog. And when it's easy, pay it forward. And when it's hard, you better pay attention. And even when you haven't the slightest idea what to do, See the beauty in just taking the next step and fall in love with the adventure of not knowing. Fall in love with the adversity of the adventure and maybe find that one someone, that one something to grind for while you enjoy the ride of your life. So in conclusion on this special day, hold up, I wanna bring my mom up here with me real quick. Mom, please join me. We're gonna finish this one together. Here she is, the real hero, right here. Give it up. Okay, you ready to do this? We're gonna finish it right here, you and me, like we always do. We want to honor you and your promising future, all the peaks and valleys to come. We cheer for you as you venture forward to learn more lessons from the tests you've yet to take. We revel in your good fortune, knowing that there is endless opportunity before you and more tools and technology than any generation that has come before you. You're better equipped than any class in history to solve humanity's biggest problems, and we need you to show us the way. So class of 2023, live with joy and purpose. Thank you for letting us celebrate you. We believe in you. And we can't wait to see how you are going to change the world. Congratulations and hook them horns. Throw them up, mom. Throw them up. <laughs>